Good morning. Do you remember the Marty Robbins song, Cool Water? Um, it's a song about a, a cowboy who's traveling across the desert and he's dying of thirst and he just yearns for water. And he just keeps going in the hopes that around the next bend he's going to find cool, clear water. Water is a building block for life. Is there life on other planets? One of the questions scientists ask is, is there water on these planets? Or is there any evidence that water used to be on these planets? Because if there's water, there's the potential for life. But if there is no water, there is no life. A person who is experiencing severe dehydration is going to experience a cotton mouth. Their mouth is going to become so dry that their tongue will stick to the roof of their mouth. Their lips might become so dry that their lips would shrivel up and disappear and their gums and their teeth will protrude out of their face. Your tongue could swell up to such a size that it fills your mouth and it feels like you're suffocating, like you cannot breathe. You develop this lump in your throat and that lump also makes you feel as if you're suffocating and you cannot breathe. And you so desperately try to swallow to remove this lump in your throat, but there is no moisture in your throat. There's no moisture in your mouth and you cannot remove the lump from your throat. Your skin uh, shrinks and, and it becomes so tight around your body that it causes you to have severe headaches. You might begin to experience blindness. You lose the ability to see. Or deafness. You lose the ability to hear. And uh, you begin to hallucinate. In World War II, uh, a Japanese submarine sunk a United States battleship. It was the USS Indianapolis. And uh, many of the sailors survived the sinking of the Indianapolis, but there they were in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Some of them were on life rafts, but others were just clinging to debris in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And unfortunately, for those who were clinging to debris, sharks came and sharks ate those who were clinging to debris. And those who were on the life rafts, they had no water. And they became severely dehydrated. They experienced all these symptoms that I just described. And they began to have hallucinations. They were so desperate for a drink of water that they began to see the things that they wanted so badly. In other words, uh, they saw these sharks swimming around their rafts. But they didn't realize that they were sharks. They, they thought that they were cars. Where are all these cars going? And someone said, hey, there's a malt shop down there. And a bunch of sailors looked over the edge of the raft and they said, where? And he said, down there about 20 feet down, there's a malt shop. All these cars must be going to the malt shop. And so several of the sailors actually jumped out of the raft and tried to swim down to the malt shop because they were so desperate for something to drink. And unfortunately, they were eaten by the sharks. Maybe one of the worst physical agonies that a person can experience is to be desperate for water and to never be able to quench that thirst. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus describes the rich man who died and he went to Hades, and in Hades, he was in torment. He was in agony. He was in so much agony. He was so desperate for a drink of water. He was so thirsty that he asked for just a single drop of water to be dropped onto his tongue. Can you imagine being so thirsty and in so much agony for uh, desiring water that, that you would think that just a single drop of water would refresh your whole body? Unfortunately for the rich man, there was not a single drop of water to be given to him, and his thirst was not quenched. Please turn in your Bibles to Numbers chapter 20. We're going to read verses 2 through 5. Numbers chapter 20, we're going to read verses 2 through 5. Numbers chapter 20, beginning in verse 2, the Bible says, There was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron. The people thus contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why then have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness? 
for us and our beasts to die here? Why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us into this wretched place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there water to drink. The Israelites find themselves in a desperate situation here. They're in the wilderness, and there is no water, and they're dehydrated, they're thirsty, they long for water. All they can think about is water, and they're so thirsty that they began to grumble against Moses and against Aaron and against God himself. What they say is, why did you bring us out of Egypt? It would have been better for us if we had stayed in Egypt, because at least in Egypt we had water to drink. But now we're out here in the middle of the wilderness, there is no water anywhere. We're all going to die of thirst. You promised us that you were going to bring us into a land of milk and honey. Well, there is no milk here. There is no honey here. There's nothing to eat. There's nothing to drink. This is a wretched place, and we're all going to die. Take a look at verses 6 through 8. Numbers chapter 20, verses 6 through 8. Then Moses and Aaron of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to them and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring water for them out of the rock the congregation and their beasts drink. Now, God is going to provide for his people. God can bring forth water out of anything. God's going to bring forth water out of the rock and provide for his people. But the thing God says in verse 8 is, take the rod. Moses is supposed to take the rod. And the question I ask is, what rod is God talking about here? What rod is Moses supposed to take? Most of my life, I would read this story and obviously I would think it's this is shepherding staff. That's the rod that Moses is supposed to take because Moses has a shepherding staff. He has a rod and he's used this rod to perform many different miracles even back in Egypt. Many of the plagues that were brought came about as a result of Moses doing something with his rod. And so Moses is supposed to bring his rod, his shepherding staff out. I realized that we're not talking about Moses' rod here. We're talking about a different rod. So if we're not talking about Moses' shepherding staff, then what rod is God telling Moses to bring out? And I think he's talking about Aaron's rod that budded. In Numbers chapter 17, the Israelites challenged Aaron's authority to serve as high priest. And God responded on behalf of Aaron. God said, not just into my presence and intercede on behalf of the people. Only the man who has been chosen by God, who has been authorized by God, can enter into my presence and intervene on behalf of the people. But the question then is, well, who has been chosen by God? Who has been authorized by God to enter into his presence? So God says, let's get a rod from the tribe of Israel. We'll also have a rod for the tribe of Levi, and on the rod for the tribe of Levi, we will write the name Aaron. But we're going to take all of these rods, and we're going to put them in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle, in the presence of God, and they're going to be there overnight. And so the next morning, we're going to bring the rods out, and we're going to see who is the man that God has chosen to enter into his presence. And when they bring the rods out the next morning, Aaron's rod had budded. Aaron's rod had produced leaves. Aaron's rod had produced flowers. Aaron's rod had produced ripe almonds. God takes a dead piece of wood, a stick, a dead piece of wood that has been cut off from the trunk of the tree and it has no roots and it has no life within it. And out of this dead piece of wood, God's, God causes life to burst forth and life in abundance. This is the sign of resurrection. And this is what God wants to do for his people. I can bless you even in the face of death. I can produce life and life in abundance. If only you would seek me 
through the man whom I have chosen, the high priest, then you will find life and life in abundance. And obviously, the story of Aaron's writing teaching us about Jesus. Because Jesus said the only sign that you're going to need is the sign of Jonah. And Jesus is speaking about his resurrection. And by means of the resurrection, we know that Jesus is a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And he serves as our high priest forever. And so this is a story that teaches us about Jesus. But when it, it, after Aaron's rod budded, all of the 12 tribes of Israel received their rods back, except for Aaron's rod, which budded, that rod goes into the Holy of Holies and is going to be in the tabernacle in the presence of God. Now, with that in mind, take a look at verse 9 here in Numbers 20, verse 9. It says, So Moses took the rod from before the Lord just as he commanded him. The reason I think we're talking about Aaron's rod that budded is because Moses had to go get the rod. Where was the rod? It was before the Lord. The rod is in the presence of God. This is the rod we're going to bring out here at this time. So it's Aaron's rod that budded. That's the rod that we're going to bring out here. Now, in verse 8, God says, speak to the rock. Moses is supposed to speak to the rock. So the question I ask is, what does Moses do with the rod? Moses does nothing with the rod. Get the rod, you bring it out, and then what? Nothing. You don't do anything with the rod. You speak to the rock, but you do nothing with the rod. So why bring the rod out? What's the point in bringing out the Aaron's rod that budded? And I think the rod itself is a visual sermon. In and of itself is teaching us about the faithfulness and power of God. What is our God like? Our God is so powerful that he can take death and out of death produce life and life in abundance. God wants to bless his people. God is capable of blessing his people. God is going to provide for your needs. You don't need to fear. You don't need to doubt. You don't need to rebel against God. You're not even dead yet. You're just thirsty. Okay? Trust in the Lord. He will provide for your needs. This is a sign of life and life in abundance. And Moses is supposed to speak to the rock. Now, this isn't the first time the Israelites found themselves in this situation. Turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 17. Let's go to Exodus chapter 17. We're going to read verses 1 through 6. Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. The Bible says, Then all the congregation ages from the wilderness of sin, according to the command of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people... Why now have you brought us children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do to this people? Moses, pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Behold, I will stand before you there at Horeb. And you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Here we see that the Israelites are in the wilderness. There's no water anywhere. They think they're going to die of thirst. What are we going to do? We're in a desperate situation. And God tells Moses to take your staff. This is Moses' shepherding staff. Take your staff and strike the rock. And water is going to come out. By the way, this is not how you find water in the desert. If you are in the desert and you're dying of thirst, 
and you just take a stick and start smacking rocks, it's not going to open up and provide water for you. But this is what God is doing because God can do anything. God is going to perform a miracle here. Moses is going to strike the rock with his staff. And in Hebrew, the word strike that is used here means strike with the intention of killing. In other words, Moses isn't going to just but Moses is going to hit the rock with such force as if to kill the rock. Moses is going to give a mortal blow, a fatal blow to the rock with his staff. And in striking the rock, it represents the death of the rock. But the interesting thing is, where is God when Moses strikes the rock? Take a look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock. What does that mean? When I read this, it seems as if God is standing on the rock in front of Moses. God says, strike the rock and strike the rock. Kill the rock. So Moses takes his staff and some kind of manifestation of God in front of Moses on the rock. And Moses strikes the rock. Is Moses actually striking God? Does Moses' staff go through whatever manifestation of the presence of God is there? And it goes right through God and it strikes the rock? And does this represent the death of God himself? And as Moses strikes the rock, with God standing right in front of him, there on the rock, boom! And it represents death. And the rock opens up and rivers of living water as a result, all of these people drink, and all of their livestock drink, and they were in such a desperate situation that they thought they were going to die, but now they have water, and they have water in abundance. They have life, and they have life in abundance. Now, let's go back to Numbers chapter 20, verse 8. Numbers chapter 20, verse 8. Numbers chapter 20, verse 8 says, Take the rod, and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation, and speak to the rock before their eyes, that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for, for them out of the rock, and let the congregation and their beasts drink. Moses is not supposed to strike the rock on this occasion. Moses is just supposed to speak to the rock, and by speaking to the rock, it will produce water. Now, I wonder what Moses was supposed to say to the rock. Hey, rock, it's me, Moses. You know, we're thirsty here. There's no water. We're in a desperate situation. Why don't you do your rock thing and just open up and give us something to drink? I don't know what Moses was supposed to say, but he's supposed to speak to the rock, and the rock is going to produce water. Now, on the first occasion, Moses had to strike the rock with his staff. He had to kill the rock. The rock had to die in order for water to come out. But on this occasion, Moses was not supposed to strike the rock. He was only supposed to speak to the rock, and it would produce water. But let's read verses 10 and 11. Verses 10 and 11. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock, and he said to them, Listen now, shall we bring forth water for you of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came forth abundantly, and the congregation and their beasts drink. Moses disobeyed God. Moses did something he was not supposed to do, something he was not authorized to do. Moses struck the rock when he was commanded to speak to the rock. And yet, even in this act of disobedience, water came out of the rock. I'm so grateful that we serve a merciful God, a God who does not give us what we deserve, but rather gives us what we need. The Israelites didn't deserve that water, and Moses' act of disobedience should not have produced living water for these rebels. 
And yet, even in the midst of Moses' disobedience and their rebellious attitude and their lack of faith in God, God still provided them with everything that they needed. Psalm chapter 103, verse 3. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. If God gave us what we deserved, we would all be condemned for eternity. But our God is a merciful God. And by the grace of God, His mercy is upon us. And we receive things that we do not deserve. The forgiveness of our sins and eternal life in Jesus the Christ. Not only did God provide water, abundance. Verse 11 says that the water came out and it came abundantly. Think about this. How much water came out of the rock? There is more than a million people present here. There are more than a million animals present here. And all of these people and all of their livestock drank water until they were totally full and totally satisfied. This is the sign of Aaron's rod that budded. That I can produce life and life in abundance. If you have faith in me, if you trust me, if you believe in me, I will provide for all of your needs and I will provide for you abundantly. And God provides water in abundance. On this. Now take a look at verse 12. Numbers chapter 20, verse 12. But the Lord Aaron, because you believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Because of Moses' disobedience, Moses is not allowed to go into the promised land. He's not going to lead the people of God into the promised land. Now, this verse is interesting, verse 12. It says, because you have not believed me. Moses did not believe God. It doesn't say because you did not believe in me, it says, because you have not believed me. What was it that Moses did not believe? I don't know. Did Moses not believe that by speaking to the rock, it would Moses think that he needed to strike the rock? Because on the first occasion, God told Moses to strike the rock. So obviously God is authorized striking the rock. I don't know what's going on here. But I think that this is true. Verse 12. To treat me as sons of Israel. Somehow Moses' disbelief is related to God's holiness. And Moses did not honor the holiness of God when he struck the rock here. God is holy, He is the Holy One. There is no one holy like Jehovah. And God is supposed to be for His holiness. And Moses is supposed to um, exalt the holiness of God. He's supposed to um, promote the holiness of God. He's supposed to honor the holiness of God. God is supposed to be glorified because of His holiness through Moses and what Moses does. And instead of exalting God for His holiness, what Moses did undermined the holiness of God in the sight of the people. Now, I was talking to John before uh, worship this morning, and he asked me what I was going to preach on. I said, Moses striking the rock. John's comment to me was, man, Moses struck the rock, and God didn't let him go into the promised land, and that seems harsh. And I agree with John. It does seem harsh. That's a harsh punishment. But then John went on to say, if God would punish that harsh, one mistake, imagine what he would do to me. And then he said, but I am thankful that I am in Christ. And I said, John, the whole point of the sermon, you just summarized it right there. He did it in 45 seconds. <laughs> but he's right. I mean, if God would be harsh enough to, I mean, when you consider everything that Moses sacrificed for God's sake and for Israel's sake, 
and how Moses' life was turned upside down for God's sake and for Israel's sake, and how Moses served God and served the people of Israel for all of these years, and then for making one simple mistake, he's not allowed to go into, into the promised land? Doesn't that seem harsh? What was so bad about what Moses did? Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. First Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4 says, For I do not that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same drink, for they were from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. This story really is the story of Jesus. It's teaching us about the person and work of Jesus. The first time when the Israelites were thirsty and there was no water anywhere and God told Moses to strike the rock, Moses had to strike the rock because it symbolizes the death of Jesus. So when Moses strikes the rock and water comes out, rivers of living water, this represents Jesus' sacrifice and the blessings that we receive through his death. Jesus says in John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become him a well of water to eternal In John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. For he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Jesus is the source of living water. Jesus is the source of life and life in abundance. We have eternal life in Jesus the Christ. The rock is a type of Jesus. So on the first Jesus had to strike the rock because Jesus had to die. However, on the second occasion, Moses absolutely should never have struck the rock. He should have spoken to the rock as God told him to do. But instead, Moses strikes the rock. And when Moses strikes the rock on the second occasion, Moses ruins the time. He ruins the teaching of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus lived a Jesus never sinned, even though he was tempted in all points as we are. Jesus never sinned. He lived a perfect life. Therefore, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice to take away our sins. Jesus died for us. But Jesus only died once. He didn't need to die two times. He didn't need to die three times. He did not need to die multiple times because the perfection that was found in Jesus made his one-time sacrifice perfect for all human beings. In fact, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 26. Let us read Hebrews chapter 9, verses 24 through 26. Hebrews 24 says, For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor was it that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once... 
at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Jesus' life was so perfect that he only needed to die once to accomplish the forgiveness of sins for all mankind. Now, Moses ruined that typology when he struck the rock on the second time. And yet, even in Moses' disobedience, God still put forth water to save the lives of these people. Moses represents the law of Moses. Moses represents Judaism. I think he represents the scribes and the Pharisees who cried out, crucify him, crucify him. His blood be upon us and on our children. And even that act of disobedience in crucifying Jesus provided forgiveness even for the very people who wanted Jesus to die. That rivers of living water came out as a result of Jesus' death, which could be accessed even by the very people who organized and orchestrated the murder of Jesus himself. And this is the mercy of God. This is the... 10 and 11, Jesus said... I came that they might have life and they might have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now Moses is not going to be able to enter into the promised land. But the truth of the matter is, Moses was never going to enter into the promised land. It was never God's intention that Moses would lead these people into the promised land. Take a look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 18. Please turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 3, verse 18. Galatians 3, verse 18. It says, For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. Skip down. 24 through 26. Galatians 24. Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Let's read verse 27. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Moses was never going to lead the into the promised land. Why not? Because the inheritance is not received by the law. Moses represents the law. He represents the law of Moses. And the inheritance does not come about through the law, but rather through the promise. What promise? The promise that God made to Abraham, that in your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed, that a descendant of Abraham, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, would come into the world and a blessing would be made available to all of humanity through him. Jesus is the promise. And it is through the promise that the inheritance is received. Moses could not have led the Israelites into the promised land. It had to be Joshua who led the Israelites into the promised land because Joshua represents Jesus. In what sense? The word Joshua is an English translation of a Hebrew word. The word Jesus is an English translation of a Greek word. But the words Joshua and Jesus are the same word. In Hebrew, it is Yeshua, Yeshua, Yeshua will lead you into the promised land. And just as Joshua led the Israelites into the promised land, Jesus is the one who gives us our eternal inheritance today. Just as John said, I'm glad that we are in Christ because in Christ we receive all of the blessings that God pours out upon his people abundantly. And outside of Christ, there is only death. We need to be in Jesus. Jesus is the fountain of living water. And outside of Jesus, there is just dehydration and death. Won't you come to Jesus? 
Won't you be a part of the body of Christ, a child of God, a disciple of Jesus the Messiah, and drink deeply from the living water that Jesus provides? If you would like to respond to this message, if you would like to uh, talk about salvation, what you need to do to be a child of God, we would be glad to study with you and, and um, help you in that process. But we invite you to come forward at this time as we stand and sing the invitation song.